Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5, chapter 4, I mean. Galatians chapter 4. And those of you toward the back would probably get more out if you'd come up. I will not talk any longer if you get up closer. Got me a bookmark here called One Day at a Time. That's what I've been doing every day for 49 and a half years. I get up there and look at that old woman. I say, just one day at a time. <laughs> Does anyone have a taxi going to Arlington? <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> Ned stick with the scriptures. Ned and I both need to ride home tonight. <laughs> you have to go out of your way to go with him and me. Galatians chapter 4. Sunday we're planning to finish this uh, book of six chapters by taking chapter 5 in the Bible class that morning and chapter 6 in the sermon that night. And so you might be reading and studying the last two chapters. The key verse in many ways in this chapter is 4. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. That phrase, in the fullness of time, is much like in due time, Christ died of the ungodly in Romans 5, 6. Uh, it simply means a very important, propitious, auspicious, outstanding uh, moment came in eternal planning when Christ came to earth. It had been prophesied several times in the Old Testament that he would come. But in this context, he's adding on to what he's already taught about the New Testament sealed in the blood of Christ and that the Judaizing teachers trying to bind the law of Moses on the Gentiles were out of step with time and eternity. They've overlooked the fact that God had promised the Messiah. Again, in John 5, 39, Jesus said to the Jewish leaders, you have searched the scriptures and they are they which testify of me. And yet when I've come, Though you claim to believe the scriptures, you crucified the very one the scripture said was coming. In uh, that passage in Romans 5, 6, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died of the ungodly. The point that he's making is the coming of Christ was an outstanding event. Of course, the uh, Orthodox Jew today will say the Messiah still hadn't come. And they'll even say Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. That's wrong. John chapter 4 uh, the woman at the well in Samaria said, I know that Messiah cometh, and when he comes, he'll tell us all things. Jesus said, I that speak unto thee am he. John 4, 23 through 26. And then uh, we have uh, other passages too, like John 9, when he healed the blind man and went back to heal him spiritually. Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Who is it that might believe? The blind man said, I that speak unto thee am he. So uh, to say Christ never claimed to be the Messiah, that he didn't fulfill the prophecies concerning the Messiah, is wrong. And the point that this ex-leader of the Jews is saying to these fickle Galatians is, in due time, uh, Christ came to die for our sins. Moses didn't die for our sins. Solomon didn't. Joshua didn't. Abraham didn't. David didn't. It took the blood of Christ, the death of Christ, to nail the old law of the cross and usher in salvation. And it came in the fullness of time. Would you argue against the timing of an eternal God? Is really what he's saying. But as long as you stand in rejection of the Messiah and try to bind the old law in the, in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant on the Gentiles, uh, you really snub your nose in the face of God. Uh, you remember at the end of chapter 3, he tells us the law was added because of transgressions until Christ should come. And now we're no longer under the schoolmaster. And wherefore then serveth the law, it was given to check sin until Christ would come. So he's already built up to that. And he said, and if you be Christ's, then, and you could even add, and only then, because that's the emphasis of the context, uh, can you be Abraham's seed yourself? And you're not like Abraham because you want to be justified by the law of Moses. And he died 400 years before that was ever given. And you want to bind circumcision on the Gentiles so they can uh, have your stamp of approval that they're now pleasing with God 
And you cite Abraham as the foundation for that, but Abraham was given that right to prove he already was pleasing to God. You've got Abraham out of Kelter with truth. You've got the law of Moses out of shape. You rejected the prophets. In 1 Peter 1, 10 through 13, we read that Christ is the fulfillment of what the prophets wrote but never lived to see, and which the angels desire to look into. Now you are the recipients of all the prophets wrote and taught and looked forward to. So he's simply saying God is in all of this because it was in the fullness of time he sent forth his son. Back in Genesis, there are three prophecies, 315, 2218, and 49.10 in the opening book of the Old Testament. The Pentateuch, the books of five that Moses was writing about that say Christ is coming. You'll be the seed of woman. And that's fulfilled right here. You'll be the seed of Abraham, and that's Galatians 3.16. And you come from the tribe of Judah. And Hebrews 7.14 said, It is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. And he's called the lion, L-I-O-M, the strongest member of the tribe of Judah in Revelation chapter 5. So they're rejecting their own scriptures, the very foundation of all the scriptures, the book of Genesis, the Old Testament prophets, and just reality. And how could they explain logically why he would leave leadership in Judaism, a pompous position, to become a Christian, to be persecuted by those he once led, if there's no reality in Christianity? He's a major roadblock to them, and that's why they vowed, Acts 24, they neither eat nor sleep until he was dead. So when he adds on verse 4 of chapter 4, he really gets the point. Now we're ready to discuss a chapter that deals with adoption by those who are Christians into the family of God. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. For it's when he's a baby and a young person, he just eats and sleeps and has his needs taken care of while a slave out in the field has that. So he doesn't know he's privileged. He has to be taught that. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman or born of a woman, born under the law. Which Christ himself lived and died under the law. But Colossians 2 says in his death he nailed the old law of the cross. And he goes on to say that don't you ever again let anybody condemn you in regard to a Sabbath day or a new moon or one of the feast days. Why? They've been nailed to the cross. They've been taken out of the way. They're no longer there. You forget your own prophecies that you cherish and they come with the Messiah and deny he did come, reject him, and bind these false notions on the Gentiles and that was spiritual arrogance, elitism. Uh, you're not as good as we are. Uh, we tower over you. That was their attitude toward the Gentiles. And that's why Paul in chapter 2 wouldn't allow Peter to get away with the hypocrisy that left the impression that Gentiles were second-class citizens. And so he rebuked him to his face where he used to be blamed be walking right uprightly according to the gospel. He couldn't for one hour allow that. Or the Gentiles would continue to say, see, they think we're second-class citizens. We don't count. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. There's some real interesting things, like heir, joint heir, uh, sons of God. Uh, Jesus Christ is God's only begotten, unique, one-of-a-kind son. There'll never, ever be another son of God like that. But we can be adopted sons and inherit all the blessings that his son has. Now you may say, now where did you get that? Romans 8, 17. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now just stop and think about that. Whatever Christ has through eternity, I'll have if I'm in heaven. I'm a joint heir with the only begotten Son of God. So that's what it means to be adopted by God into his unique family with his unique one-of-a-kind Son that we can be heirs too, joint heirs with Christ. I heard the story years ago of a Pentecostal preacher that liked to show off by just throwing his Bible down on the pulpit and wherever it opened, he'd just start reading and preach from that. 
he thought to be prepared was a shame, you know. It didn't take long for people to tell he never was prepared, but he couldn't read very well either. And he looked there at Romans 8, 17, and he said, Praise God, I never noticed before. I'm higher than God and a joint higher than Christ. He couldn't, didn't even know how to spell the word, see. Well, when you stop and meditate upon Romans 8, 17, now that's an amazing thing. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We've been adopted into the family. And in Hebrews 2, 12, it says Christ is not ashamed to call us brethren. It's an interesting thing. Uh, when Jesus left heaven and came to earth and identified with humanity, he didn't become less divine, but he became human as well. In the sense that he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. And I believe the greatest thing Christ gave up, as we reason, was to identify with humanity. He'll be forever identified with humanity since we're joint heirs with him. I don't mean he's not divine and fully divine. But 30 years after he had ascended from the Mount of Olives back to heaven, Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's one mediator between God and men, himself man, Christ Jesus. But this man, after he made one sacrifice for sin, sat down on the right hand of God, Acts 17, verse 30. By that man whom he hath ordained will be judged, Acts 17, 30, again, that context. He has identified with us forever, if by no other means, that we're his joint heirs. Now, you talk about something to meditate upon that thrills your soul. That's what heaven was willing to do, that we might be saved, redeemed, and inherit all the blessings of heaven. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. So, when he says, born of a woman, born under the law, and then we can have the adoption of sons. Uh, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And that's probably the richest point we've come to yet. Abba, Father. The first sound emitted from the little baby's uh, mind and mouth, uh, to look at the father and say, Abba. Like we have babies say, Daddy. But as you grow older and mature and you understand more fully, that one you didn't really know who he was thoroughly, you know now and call him Father. And when we lose that childlike faith and trust in Jehovah, he can only say Father. And we never think of him as one who protected us and cared for us when we were babies, when we were young. Uh, I've known some families that uh, set up all night long with a little boy or a little girl because uh, they couldn't lay down. They had asthma real bad. You either had to sit in the chair and rock them or walk. And I've done that two or three times, one with another preacher's child because he and his wife were exhausted. I was in a meeting in Minnesota with this couple I knew real well from college days. And they were literally just sleepwalking around. And this little girl was just about to die. And uh, the point, though, is that the father now plays a different role, a life-saving role. Whereas at first, the child didn't even know about life and death. So the point he's making is when we're adopted by God as sons and daughters into his family, and we have a relationship that is so deep and so rich, but until we comprehend that, we may just have baby talk. But as we grow older and that care and concern continues, uh, then it's father with an understanding of what that means. And that's why to me the saddest thing in all the world in humanity and families is when a father or mother generously gave of time and prayer and so forth and when that child gets older they curse them or uh, deny their leadership in their life turn their back upon them uh, i don't know of anything sadder in all the world and there are some very very ungrateful boys and girls today very ungrateful there's nothing sadder in all the world but when we mature as Christians and grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, 2 Peter 3, 18, and we understand that this Father and that concept of our Father was the same one that cared for us when we didn't even know who they were. And we couldn't even call their name. Well, there's a richness here about what being adopted means. I know a pretty well-known preacher who's a good Greek student that denies that the word adoption is correct and that to use the analogy of adopted sons, it just won't work. We are sons 
and daughters of God, not adopted. Well, we'd have to just deny what this passage says. That's why it bothers me when someone gets to know so much Greek, they unteach what the Bible says, though it's translated from the Greek. A fellow ought to watch on something like that. I don't believe you can get that smart. Uh, you see, 40 inspired writers, inspired by the Holy Spirit, gave us the Bible. I believe they're smarter than any Greek book or any Greek class or any Greek teacher. How are you going to deny this? In Romans 8, 17, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Wherefore, now that word again is a hinge word. Remember that every time you read it in the New Testament. It means it ties what's preceded with what follows. As a result of everything he said in the first uh, six verses, as we have it, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We're not God's only begotten son, just been one of those. But we are adopted children of God, sons and daughters of God. That ought to be one of the blessings that thrill our soul as we, how in the world could I be a joint heir with Christ? Well, I have to be baptized into Christ and put on Christ, as he said in Galatians 3.27. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, Romans 13.14. Buried with Christ in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through faith in the operation of God. Colossians 2.12 and 13. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Howbeit, then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, wherein ye desire again to be in bondage? See, the law of Moses was a law of bondage. Two reasons. You couldn't live perfectly under it, and there was no efficacious blood to play the role that you needed beyond your own abilities. See, the major difference in the Old Testament than you both dedicated by blood, but one by the blood of bulls and goats that can never take away sin. Hebrews 10, 4. The other by the once for all time sacrifice for sin by Christ, who shed his blood for the remission of sins. Matthew 26, 28. So, do you want to go back to the law of bondage? You can never be released from it under the plan of the blood of bulls and goats. The Levitical priests who had to be replaced because of death and sin were superseded, surpassed by Christ who never sinned and who rose from the dead, just as he said he would. Why would you revert to that system? Why would you want to bind that on somebody else? There are always those who want to press their will upon others instead of the will of God. One of the best songs that we never ever sang anymore, but I grew up hearing it a lot, <coughs> is this uh, song that speaks of uh, sweet peace that comes. Uh, when we surrender, submit to God. Uh, we need to appreciate what Christianity can do for us and show our gratitude by living nearer to God and telling others about the Christ. You desire again to be in bondage. You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now, I want you to listen real, real carefully to what I'm about to say. I have a double-pronged purpose for it. Most of you have probably gathered by now that I'm not much on December 25th or Easter or any of those things that relate to uh, the religion of the Son of God and are thus are perverted and really bow the knee to the Pope of Rome, Christ, Mass, and so forth, all that sort of thing. But it is wrong to use this context. It would be wrong for me to say, and the reason I take that stand is this passage right here, you observe days and months and so forth. He's talking about Judaizing teachers who observe the Sabbath day and the new moon and the special feast of Judaism to bind it on the Gentiles. He said, you were converted from Judaism to Christianity. Now you're binding these things upon the Gentiles and hindering our work in their midst. And I'm afraid of you. You didn't get the point. If the law was nailed to the cross and Christianity superseded that message, and the blood of Christ towers above the blood of bulls and goats. And you want to take these people back to these days? You're not thinking clearly. So if I were to use this context and say, this is why I'm opposed to those special kind of days. He's not talking about the kind of days I'm talking about. He's talking about you observe days and months and times and years. He's rebuking the Judaizers for trying to make 
Gentiles, Jews, before they can even be a Christian. That's what he's talking about there. I'm afraid of you lest I have bestowed labor upon you in vain. You remember in the first chapter he said, uh, uh, if we preach any other gospel. He said, and what you're preaching is not another gospel, but you pervert the gospel of Christ. You're not saying don't obey Christ. You're saying you have to be a Jew before you can obey Christ. You've got to pass through our channels of justification by the law of Moses. That won't work. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as you are. In other words, I'm human. I'm a Christian. You claim to be a Christian. You have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. He's going back with the Corinthians, like he did with the Corinthians. I'm the one that have be, had begotten you through the gospel. I'm your spiritual father, 1 Corinthians 4.15. Why then would you turn on me and pick up with these Judaizing teachers that are denying my apostleship and undermining your faith? And if what they're saying is so, how be there some among you who say, if you listen to them, then your faith is in vain, my preaching was in vain, and those who died in Christ have perished. Is that what you want to believe? Then we're of all men the more to be pitied and all just pick up the Epicurean philosophy, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Read that in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. But then he culminates that by saying, but now is Christ risen the dead and become the first fruits of them asleep. So do you want to go without hope and press that upon the Gentiles that we've converted and others we're trying to convert? You want to place a burden on them they'll not be able to bear? You know how that through infirmity of the flesh, and back in 2 Corinthians 12, he had a thorn in the flesh. Asked the Lord thrice to remove it, and the Lord said, No, but my grace is sufficient for you, and you'll grow strong because of trials. And because of the next statement or two here, there are those who believe they have found out what his infirmity was. You know that how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation, which, which was in my flesh, you despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, a messenger of God, even as Christ Jesus. Put in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, where he said, I beseech you in Christ's stead, as his ambassador, be you reconciled to God. Would you receive me as though Christ were there? For he really was in my ambassadorship. He's the one that sent me. He's the one that chose me. And so you understood the situation. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And as fine a Bible scholar as we've had in many, many years, Guy and Wood said he thought that passage in a statement at the end of the book, uh, see by in what large letters I've written to you, that his thorn in the flesh was bad eyesight. But uh, I've got news for you. A proverbial statement in uh, that day would, if someone was in need, that was if you would have plucked out your own eyes and given to me another is more precious to people than their eyesight. You simply saying you'd gone to the end degree even if it meant giving me your eyes but it'd be like today a proverbial statement he'd give you the shirt off his back it was a proverbial statement that applied across the board to a lot of things that may have been his thorn in the flesh I don't know I'm glad I don't know and that you don't know either because whatever your problem is you could say well maybe that's what Paul had and the Lord took care of him but whatever it was and there's reason to believe that thorn in the flesh didn't even mean a physical ailment, but maybe distress. Uh, in Numbers 33, 55 in the Old Testament, uh, turmoil within or anxiety that was called a thorn in the flesh. But I, I will admit that uh, Brother Woods has something to back up what he said. And he was a great Bible student, one of the best I ever knew. Wonderful man, too. If you ever get a a hold of any of his uh, commentaries and I think especially the one on the book of John I think that was his champion book of all time uh, there are others who believe his book on uh, first and second Peter and Jude uh, and I believe he has first second third John in that too would be one of some of his best work but uh, he may have extended himself a little bit there I don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was there are those who believe because of a Greek word uh, when he said I had a thorn in the flesh that it's the word would translate stake which would mean like uh, migraine headache which could be brought on and here's uh, some of the best background I've ever read when John Mark turned back on that first tour he was in the rock rib malaria ridden coast of, of uh, Galatia and it's notorious that people would go around it or put the brakes on and go backwards 
go, rather than go through there. And that there was nothing worse than that, uh, like someone driving a nail or a stake in your forehead, uh, which could affect the eyesight. But anyway, those are just some things. I don't know what his thorn in the flesh was, and you don't either. And even Brother Woods didn't know. But the point is, back then when I first came to you and introduced the gospel to you, there wasn't anything you wouldn't do for me. Now, how have you allowed someone to turn you back and away from the love you had for me and for the gospel I preached? Another thing he's saying all the way through this book and in 2 Corinthians, what would my ulterior motive be? Can you think of an ulterior motive I have? Well, I should have stayed with Judaism according to you and been your leader. Now I'm persecuted by you and undermined by the folk you've undermined. That'd be an awful good question to ask. If it had been possible back then at the first, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. You've gone to any extreme. Now verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Nor it's what I'm reviewing here. You know it's truth just like I do and just like God does. You know I'm telling you the truth. How I was received, how you received the message, how you helped me and encouraged me. Why have you allowed these people to come in and put you under the yoke of bondage? Why would you do that? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you. that You might affect them. His point is, you're making me your enemy when I'm your friend and making them your friend when they're your enemy. He does use some clear-cut logic, just like he did in 2 Corinthians when he said, the more I love you, the less I'll be loved. Why have you allowed people to undermine the great association, relationship, and work we had together? Remember again in 2 Corinthians uh, 11 when he mentioned all that happened to him because he was an apostle of Christ in Corinthians 11 and 12 he said and in perils of false brethren and there's nothing in the world that hurts more than that I've had two brethren in my lifetime tell me I was going to hell I've had several people in the world tell me that and I would expect it you know but boy it hurts a lot more than someone you've worked with and known and whatever the reasons uh, say that to you but uh, he's simply saying here that zeal is a good thing, but be sure it's tempered with righteousness and not something that would hurt the cause of Christ. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. So some uh, have the wrong kind of zeal and others need to have even more in a good thing. Not only when I'm present with you. Lord, you need to not allow my work in your personal presence to be undermined when I'm away from you. And make it difficult for me to communicate with you even in letters. Paul didn't like to make things personal. He certainly didn't like to boast. When he said, the more I love you, the less I be loved, he hated to have to say that. And the context proves it. So you talk about heartache and heartbreak. And don't you know that he backed off several times and said, no, wait just a minute, Paul. When you were Saul of Tarsus, you had the world at your feet. You'd been at the feet of the great noted rabbi Gamaliel. You had some credentials most Jews don't have. And you were a leader. And you were in charge of persecuting those numbskulls called Christians. Now I'm a Christian and some of my own brethren won't receive me. Besides the Judaizing element that is still angry with me. When he finally got to Rome to preach the gospel at the expense of the Roman Empire incidentally, and religious leaders of the Jews in Jerusalem came out to hear him. Or in Rome, I mean, came out to hear him. They want to know what was this traitor, this treason, uh, guilty of treason, turncoat. What in the world happened to him? And as Paul preached, he saw they weren't paying attention. They were so biased, they weren't paying any attention. So he just stopped abruptly and said, you close your eyes, shut your ears, harden your heart. Lo, I turn the Gentiles. I don't imagine the people who were there and heard him say that to them ever forgot as long as they lived for he was brilliantly educated and he knew how to talk to both sides so here's a case of it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when I'm present with you my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you and I believe that that is the greatest definition of what a Christian should be, Christ formed in us. I don't believe there's another place in the Bible that says any better than that. Even if any have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his, Romans 8 9. 
have the mind of Christ in you, Philippians 2, 5. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, 27. To me, that's the greatest single expression of what a Christian is. Christ formed within us. And when people look at us and see Christ in us, when they can tell we've been with Jesus, Acts 4, 13, we have accomplished a lot. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice where I stand in doubt of you. Now, if you don't think he backs up all of this, what he said in these 20 verses, in the next 10 verses, you haven't read and studied this allegory. I believe that this, along with Romans chapter 7 and Hebrews chapter 7, are the three deepest sections of Bible, of Scripture. You've got to put your thinking cap on here. But once you get tuned in to the frequency of what he's trying to establish here, it's rich as cream. In fact, it's unbelievable that so many things can run together right here in an art. Four different things. He's going to say, now you Jews who claim to be Christians who are trying to bind the law on the Gentiles, don't you even know your own law? Do you not even know anything about Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Ishmael and Mount Sinai and Mount Zion and the old covenant and the new? Are you just confessing your ignorance of that which you're trying to press upon these people? You don't even know what you're talking about. You couldn't even make a good case for Judaism. That's really what he's saying here. This and Hebrews 7 and Romans 7, probably the three deepest statements in all the Bible. Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Or you profess to know the law? You don't even know what you're talking about. You don't even know where you came from. You don't even know how you're identified with Abraham. And he was called the father of the Jewish nation. <clears throat> For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For well, these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, that's where Moses, through the disposition of angels, received the Old Testament law, which gendereth the bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Which you going to be tied to Hagar and Ishmael and Mount Sinai and that old covenant that was nailed to the cross? Is that what you're going to stay by on the day of judgment? You're going to be wedded to that till you meet God in judgment? But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all, of us all, Jew and Gentile. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Sarah, too old to have a child. I'm too old to have a child. God said, uh, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. I don't have any seed, and I can't have any seed. Abraham protested. It astonished Abraham and Sarah. For it is rejoice, it written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry. Thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. See, she had much offspring meaning the lineage of Abraham, the Jewish nation, the Hebrews. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. He had already proved in chapter 3 that the promise is more important than the law. The promise preceded the law. 400 years, the promise given to Abraham preceded the law. But they want to be Abraham's seed. They don't even understand what they're talking about. And here's a fellow that well knows the scripture. And one thing he knew is he knew the scripture. You don't sit at the feet of Gamaliel and not know the Old Testament. And he made that a cardinal point of his castle stairs speech when he talked to those people down at the foot of the stairs there in the court of the Gentiles that wanted to kill him. He gave an Old Testament resume that they listened to carefully and still, until he said one word, Gentiles. Acts 22, verse 22. When he said that, another uproar came. And the Roman captain didn't know what was happening. Or the children of promise. But as then he was born after the flesh, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. 
For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we're not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. As he said each of these significant points, things clicked in their minds of lessons their mother and father had read to them when they were children. What they'd heard others read, but didn't make application of it. Certainly not proper application of it. He just goes right down the line. One, two, three, four matchups. And it's always the side that applies to Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Mount Zion. Now turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, where he puts the icing on this. Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews uh, trilogy of the old law. We'll start with verse uh, 18 of Hebrews chapter 12. What a commentary. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. Talk, talk about Mount Sinai and Moses there with the tables of stone. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it should be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, which once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, but those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. The book of Hebrews written to Hebrew Christians, Christians of Hebrew extraction or background. And the whole purpose of Hebrews is the much more than better way of Christianity over Judaism. So this is a corollary to what we just read. And if you go back and read Exodus 32, now listen to this. When the law came forth from Sinai, 3,000 were slain because of sin. But when the law of Christ came forth from Jerusalem, 3,000 were saved. 3,000 slain, 3,000 saved. Mount Sinai slain, Mount Zion saved. And in Romans chapter 2 and repeated in chapters 9 and 11, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, makes this point in another treatise, Romans, on the same subject. A man is not a Jew who is just one outwardly. See, those attached to Abraham through Ishmael and Hagar were not truly sons of Abraham. It's only those who are baptized into Christ and put on Christ and let the new covenant rule them that are the seed of Abraham. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed. You talk about knocking the stuffings out of an argument and out of a people. The Judaizing teachers just uh, were breathless by the end of chapter 4. And it's all based upon verse 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born under the law, born of a woman, born under the law. But he nailed the old law to the cross, broke down the wall of partition, containing ordinances, the Ten Commandments, that separate Jew and Greek, and made of both one, both Jew and Gentile one, and reconciled them both unto God by his shed blood at Calvary. Ephesians 2, 11 through 16. They had been without hope, without God in this world. Now they were in Christ. They stood on level ground, one with the other. God is no respecter of persons. Chapter 5 and 6 on Sunday, 
So be ready by having read and studied and even maybe put down some questions or make your own outline. Run some references. And Galatians 5 is notoriously good, if you can use that together, for the discussion of the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. And the vivid contrast between the two and the Galatians, Judaizing Galatians, uh, the works of the flesh dominated in their life. Wonder why they stress this and talk this jealousy, envy, arrogance. They didn't want to stand on level ground with those dreadful heathen, those pagan. They divide the world into us and the heathen. That was the way they divide the world. Christianity won't allow that. Chapters 5 and 6, Sunday morning and Sunday night, Lord willing.